So the point I'm making, what the electorate wants is a proper centre-right party which is afraid, not afraid to present its arguments and to go against the media and the main and what people think the other side is doing and to present in a narrative what, what they stand for. Um, if I may ask, um, in terms of policies, what were some of the highs and lows during, during uh, the Liberal government's time in power? The coalition from 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, um, well, winning, 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 winning was a high. Uh, so they won three elections. So that's, that's a reasonable high. Uh, admittedly, the last, the last two with a very small majority. They did some minor reforms. Uh, from my point of view, since I worked for two education ministers, the great achievement was getting through uh, school funding legislation in um, uh, 2017 through the Senate, um, which which put the funding of schools, uh, non-government schools, uh, on a little playing field for the first time in 50 years, uh, then unfortunately modified by uh, Morrison. Um, so, yeah, there were, I mean, basically, basically winning government, holding on to office, minor changes. There's not, there's not a great deal that stands out, particularly for the coalition government this period. There's no, there's no um, great uh, burning light of, of reforms. They, they didn't, they were handicapped all the time by a very hostile Senate. And they were handicapped all the time by a very hostile media. And they were handicapped by the fact they didn't know what they wanted to achieve. Interestingly, in on the uh, election that transpired on the 21st of May, 2022, while the Liberal Party indeed lost the, you know, to the ground to the teal so-called independents and uh, the Greens picking up four seats, what we did notice is that the National Party managed to retain all its seats despite that. Have any of you guys got a would like, well, Scott particularly, I'd, I'd be really interested if you in, in finding out your thoughts on that. Well, the National Party historically always loses less seats than the Liberal Party. Um, okay, when the Liberal Party loses big time, the National Party normally doesn't lose big time. In, in 1969, and where the Liberal Party lost 15 seats, the National Party lost one. In 1972, when Whitlam got elected, the, the Liberal Party lost eight more seats and the National Party lost none, okay? Yeah. And that tends to be partly because of where the National Party seats are, um, which are outer regional seats, regional seats, Queensland seats, New, out of New South Wales seats. It's partly to do with a more different demographic. That, that partly explains um, the National Party success. Mm -hmm. This time, but they've been holding their own for the last three elections essentially very well. And it's certainly not because of um, leadership stability since they've had uh, several different leaders in that period, as many as the Liberal Party has. But it's to do with the demographics and the, and the, and the, and the economics going on in those areas. I suppose that leads pretty well into my next question. Uh, with Peter Dutton being the new opposition leader, you wrote an op-ed saying that political parties should avoid circling around a cult of personality in order mm. to be relevant to voters. Would Peter Dutton face this kind of risk? What, what I'm saying is you can't, t today in modern day politics, more than ever, because of the media, the 24 hour cycle, there's a phenomenal emphasis put on the leaders and a lot ex is expected of them. All I was trying to say in that article is this, this, this isn't just Dutton's party. Like, like I mean, Turnbull, in the, in the 2016 election, almost thought it was Turnbull's party. It wasn't Turnbull's party. Um, the Liberal Party does not belong to a single individual. Um, and it is, it is a complex broad church. It is a complex broad church, okay? Um, and so, 
All I'm saying is anyone who thinks the magic solution is just change the leader. We, you know, New South Wales, a uh, Liberal Party went through multiple changes of leadership um, as we have in Queensland when they're in opposition. Uh, and Victoria has done the same. That They've had three leaders in four or five years. Uh, it's not it's not the magic solution, but it's it's the whole party's responsibility, and it's the whole party's fault of where the party is uh, and when they lose. Okay, that's what that's what I'm saying. And a lot of people are attacking Dutton uh, unfairly and, and inaccurately. Um, just remember, Dutton was the one who made the move against Turnbull, and the progressives in the Liberal Party put their weight behind Morrison, okay? All right, just remember what went on. Um, uh, so what do you mean by it's the whole party's fault? Well, it's it's the party organisation, okay? The, the the membership in the Liberal Party has declined, like it's declined in all organisations. Uh, once upon a time, don't, don't you see, if you notice after the election, um, how there was so much public talk by Former, lead, former ministers, backbenchers, in the National Pay too, criticising the party. Now, once upon a time, when the Liberal Party was organised, that would not have been allowed. The president of the party would have rung someone up and told them to shut up, OK? Right? You don't have your public debates in public. You have your debates about the party behind closed doors. So the party has been very lazy, and I put that partly down to public funding too, about the membership and the structures. Uh, and, and this look what went on before the federal election, where I think for the first time in Liberal Party history, the federal party intervened in New South Wales to resolve the deadlock over pre-selection. Um, so the, the, the Liberal Party uh, has, has, to me, lost its way in its membership, the way members are selected, and the, the, you know, the fact that members don't feel that they're part of anything that they belong to. So it's, it is the whole party's organisation, and and the lack of training of staff and so on uh, in members' offices means that the party is not maximising its abilities and influence in the community. So it's, it is the whole party's responsibility. And the Liberal Party is a federal party. So Mr Dutton doesn't control the LNP in Queensland. He doesn't control the Liberal Party in New South Wales. He doesn't control the Liberal Party in Victoria. And he doesn't control the National Party. So you can't... So the Liberal Party's got to sit down and get its act together about the way it operates. That's what Menzies brought... That's what, that's Menzies' great achievement was setting up an organised political party, which we didn't have under the UAP or the Nationalist Party. We didn't have branches. We didn't we didn't have discussions or conventions and so on. That's what means we set up, and that's been gradually lost over the years. So, is that when people say that uh, the party needs to return to that of Menzies? Is that hopefully what they're talking about? That openness, that solid structure, that sort of grassroots campaigning, volunteering? Hmm. Well, the, the, the Liberal Party, most people in the Liberal Party don't even know who Menzies is, quite frankly, uh, have little understanding of his achievement. He's regarded as a grey-haired old man on top of the stairs. Um, Menzies was a pretty tough, resilient politician uh, who won uh, seven elections in a row, uh, and he won it. He, he, he used every different electoral system and technique to win those elections. Um, they, they, they have forgotten really what Menzies set up and why he set it up in a particular way. Now, I know it was a different time, and I'm not naive, that we're talking about the 40s and the 50s and 60s and so on, and, and times have moved on. Um, but uh, there's, there's too many people in the Liberal Party I think who joined the party to get a seat rather than to join the party for the cause. Okay, and the Labor Party is a bit different, I think. And there are too many people looking to join the party to, to add to their CV rather than because they're true believers of anything in particular. Mm. So many, a lot of people 
you know, a lot of people don't even know in the Queensland LNP that Terry White, the chemist, led the Liberal Party to its biggest defeat against the National Party in 1983, okay? Most people don't know the history. That's the point I'm trying to make, is people have a very poor Sorry. grasp of history. You, you, work, you work at you're at a university, so you know that you don't teach you know, don't teach much history at universities. Okay? Oh no, I'm doing a history degree, and I, I'm well aware they don't teach history anymore. It's a lot of uh, how do I put this nicely? Very some, uh, quite a few crazy social theories. Mm. So, so yeah, critical theory has very much um, sort of it, um, inundated the humanities, and I had a lot of that in my undergrad as well. Um, Mm. Why do you put up with it? Well, I, I'm now I'm now doing my masters, and it's a it's a lot better. Um, the masters is okay. better. I, I I personally did find that it was useful because now I understand what's going on in the world. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of people when they engage with critical theory, they don't know what it is. They don't understand what its ends are. They don't understand that it's um, that it's anti essentialist. Um, yeah. And, and how how it's undoing the fabric of um of our, of our society, which I suppose leads on yeah. rather rather well into this next question. Um, now we've seen many liberals and conservatives harken back to you know John Howard and Robert Menzies um, when when the party wasn't powerful for longer periods. Um, we have a very different Australia now. What do you think would make a successful centre right party in the twenty first century? Well, the first thing is should be centre right, <laughs> uh, right? If you, want, if you want to be a successful centre right party, you've got to be centre right. Um, Not centre left. Uh, that helps, uh, you know, quite a lot. We, we, the Liberal, the, the coalition uh, and, and non-Labor side of politics is scared of its own shadow, essentially. Now, um, I'm not talking about espousing policies from the 40s, but I am, you know, firstly, um, the, the successful times when the coalition has been successful is it's when, it's when it's been different from the opposite, from the ALP, okay? Mm -hmm. Mendes won in 49 because he espoused different policies than academics supposed and what the ALP stood for. Malcolm Fraser won the biggest federal election victory in federal history because he adopted a very different approach to Billy Snedden uh, and led the Liberal Party to, to stand on different stuff on federalism, to reverse the Whitlam thing. He, 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 he was in contrast to Whitlam. He was in contrast to the wets, in a sense. Now, we can argue how he was in government is a different thing, but, you know, he won two big victories overwhelmingly. John Howard, remember John Howard was espousing privatisation, uh, deregulation, industrial relations reform for a long, long time and was laughed at. And, and was laughed at by the party and by the ALP, who partly adopted some of his policies. Uh, who, who won in the end? So the point I'm trying to make is the, if, if you know, people like Senator Birmingham, my former employer, uh, he's from the progressive wing of the Liberal Party, but show me where the progressive wing of the Liberal Party has been successful, okay? So they haven't been successful in South, in South Australia, have they? Between 2001 and 2018, they lost every election. They just lost another election. They haven't been successful in Victoria, uh, led by Wets and so on. And they certainly haven't been successful in Queensland, where they've won one election in 12, okay? So the point I'm making, what the electorate wants is a proper centre-right party which is afraid, not afraid to present its arguments and to go against the media and the main and what people think the other side is doing, and to present in a narrative what what they stand for. Okay, I never I never saw Morrison or any member, including including Mr. Frydenberg, make one major critical comment of the Andrews government over the lockdowns, the imprisonments, um, the police state that developed. Okay, that's the point. Where, where was the Liberal Party? Where was the Liberal Party on that issue? And these are people who say they, they're a small L Liberals. You must be kidding me. In Queensland, and you know, the LNP in Queensland, and the Liberal Party federally, um, allowed the economy to be closed down 
and didn't defend small business, right? Yep. The Liberal Party is supposed to be the party of small business. Yep. The Labor Party, which is supposed to be the party of the working class, mm -hmm. allowed businesses to be closed down and, and people who worked in shops and so on had no jobs. So yep. no one defended the working people. The, the National Party, uh, which is supposed to represent the farmers and so on, um, they probably came out of it a bit better and so on. Now, those, those Labor voters you talk about, yeah. we should not forget. We should not forget. Never. Uh, and um, Never. that a lot of those voters uh, were called, we used to call them aspirational voters, right? And they're the ones who supported John Howard um, because, because he supported a good economy, a growing economy. And just remember, unions, you know, what's happened to the Labor Party? The Labor Party's become a feminist party, right? Yep. And the reason not for that... It's not a party anymore. Pardon? It, it, it seems to have completely and utterly cut ties with that traditional kind of male... You know, the down at the pub works fifteen hours a day in a sort of heavy industry job. It's yeah, that, that's that's because that that's because the heavy industries are gone. That's yeah. because um, you know we've lowered the tariffs, so a lot of the men's, if you like, work disappeared. The the unions, the powerful unions these days are the nursing union, dominated by women. And the teachers' union, and as you know, at your school, local school, 80% of all teachers are female, okay, right? And so the Labor Party has become the, the feminist party in a sense, right? That's what's happened. And, and then the, the, you know, you've got the, one of the results of the Whitlam period was more people going to university. What do people do when they go to university? Um, most of them do arts degrees. What do you get taught arts degrees? You know what they get taught arts degrees. Everything so that's what's happened to the Labor Party. The, the yeah. Labor Party is, is, is no longer a working class party. Okay? It's a joke. That's a joke. Yeah. I mean, um, how, many, how many Labor ministers, how many present Labor ministers have done, have been a blue collar worker really at all? Okay? Al he's never had a real job, has he? Has he really had a real job? Um, so, and you can say that with all the parties, that's been that's been happening. The, yeah, the, the way the parties have become professionalised. But like in its in politics, professionalising that I think sort of um, this election is fair to say it was the growing it was sort of the sign that people getting sick of the two major parties. That's why you had an explosion of teals. The UAP even coming to exist. Um, do you reckon that is in part due to this idea that politics is just for opportunistic people who only focus on their career and not for a particular cause? Uh, look, just remember, remember the Teals were only successful in certain areas, okay? Yeah. They, they, they were only successful in certain areas, and, and as were the Greens in certain areas. Um, um, so that that's um, I, I think I think you know, don't you, that people have ceased joining things. Okay, so I mean, they can join Get Up by a click, but people exactly. don't come to you know all all the service clubs are in decline. The Rotary Club, the Lions Club, and all those sort of clubs. Um, and attendance at churches and so on are all down. And so there's that. But, but to sort of say that um, uh, we're going to vote for a person who went to a rich uh, school on North Shore and that person represents the average person, you must be kidding me, uh, sort of thing. Or your, or your father your father is um, uh, chairman of a big corporation or something. So. I, I think what's been happening is is our, the fragmentation of our society over ages, and what is called um, expressive individualism. You know, basically, everyone has their own view, uh, and we want to try and express it. And that's the parties, uh, the major parties, are having trouble dealing with. 
that they 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 can't stretch the broad church too much more because there's too many non-believers joining. Yeah, I was I was going to ask about that. Um, did the Liberals attempt a broad church at the last election that included Labor? I don't think so. I don't think that's a possibility. Um, certainly, there is an argument that the two major parties probably have more in common than than people think. The the ALP people, Labor people, hate the Greens. <laughs> I can tell you right here now. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's no love there at all. If you talk to a Labor person, uh, you'll get you'll get very qu quick shift if you think that they're they're holding hand under the table. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, no no and, Labor Greens alliance that we all keep hearing about. Hmm. So this is not Germany. No, Germany is German politics, where you have the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats and the Greens all in one, which I find completely completely difficult to understand. Uh, this is not Germany at all. And that won't, that won't work in, a, in the Australian context. Um, so, you know, I mean, I mean, I live in an electorate, uh, Brisbane electorate. Um, the sitting member had been doing a good job, as far as I can see. Uh, he was not an arch conservative, um, but he was uh, a loyal liberal. Um, this is an electorate which is uh, got a high proportion of Catholics, and 50% uh, of the kids go to private schools. Okay, 50% in, didn't go to uh, in secondary schools. Now, I didn't see the Liberal Party run a campaign against the Greens. The Greens are against private schools. Okay, right? Yep. That would have been my campaign. Vote Green. They'll cut the subsidy to the private school. Is that what you want? <laughs> um, so. You know, the Liberals did not run. Uh, did not run a very did not run a very aggressive campaign because they're too scared to come out of the show. They're too scared to to really get in the boxing ring and say this is what we stand for. Okay, and the art of politics is to convince people what you stand for. It took twenty years in Australia to get the GST. Twenty years now. People were talking about nuclear power. John Howard had an inquiry into nuclear power in 2006. It will take you, you've got to be at it for 20 years to get to get a policy through. Okay, um, so it, it takes a lot of time in these things. The um, uh, the Victorian Liberals recently expelled Bernie Finn from the party for posting comments against abortion, like the fact that this position would be supported. Um, by sitting members of the Liberals, at least certainly in New South Wales. Um, given the state election is happening there at the end of the year, should the Victorian Liberals have done this? And does social conservatism have a future in the party? Well, if they don't have a future in the Liberal Party, they've got a future nowhere then. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and um, they would just spring up in other places like One Nation. Um, uh, there, are two, there are two issues there. Firstly, I think it was the tone of his language that was the problem. Um, and you should be able to be against abortion and you should be able to be against climate change and you should be able to be against the constitutional change and recognition of Aborigines without being labelled as something, right? Um, now, obviously, I think in his case, I think his language is a bit inappropriate. And what should have happened there, again, again the Liberal Party running scared. So he said this thing, he, he said it in, ineptly, and he should have been reprimanded for that. But he shouldn't be reprimanded having a view of, of, on abortion, which is, a, which is opposite to what the Andrews government. And, I, I, and I, you should be able to be in the Liberal Party and say, um, and, and, and the word abortion reform, be careful what we mean by reform, um, uh, and be against uh, euthanasia, I'm against euthanasia. Um, that doesn't that doesn't mean label you as some sort of extreme person. Now, I'm not in favour of people ramming their cars into abortion clinics or things like that. That's mm. that's silly. So again, I think I think the Liberal Party mishandled that situation because they themselves don't quite know what they stand for and they're afraid to articulate it and go out and discuss it. I think. I think the Liberal Party in Victoria recently, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, 
agreed to the Andrews government change the constitution not to have um, gas exploration or something. Is that correct? Oh, uh, is, that, is that right? Did they, did they go along with that? Is that, that, is that true? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah. If that's true, it's ridiculous. Yeah, that is can... true. That's really dumb, isn't it? <laughs> how, how can you be against gas exploration uh, when, well, when, when we're needing gas? Where do these people think they're going to get the energy from? Just, just wind power. That's, that's right? correct. So, so the oh. point I'm trying to make with the Liberal Party, the Liberal Party um, needs to sit down, really, and have it out uh, about what it's what it's what it's standing for. Um, and uh, it's it's not it's it's not just prag. It's got to be pragmatic, but um, it's got to be pragmatic with with some sort of principle behind it. Okay, and the Liberal Party looks because the Liberal Party's been in office a long lots of times. It looks like it's pragmatic just for politics. There's a difference. There's a difference. Okay, um, you can be pragmatic. I had to get legislation through the Senate, and I worked for uh, Mackenzie and Birmingham and and Pine. Um, so you've got to do some sort of deal with the cross bench, uh, but you still got to get your main legislation through. Otherwise, it's not your legislation. Okay, um, and it can be done. Um, I don't think many of us are too familiar with uh, with the new deputy leader. Can you tell us more about Susan Lay? Well, she's been a member a long time um, in that sort of um, seat of Farrah, which used to be Wall Fife seat. You know, Wall Fife was a New South Wales minister and then went to federal politics. Um, and so it's based around um, uh, that sort of northern part of um, uh, the part of New South, both southern part of New South Wales. So she's been a member a long time. Um, she held some minor positions in the Howard government, um, and then in the Abbott government, she was assistant minister for education to Christopher Pine. Okay, um, and she held that for about uh, eight months or nine months, and then moved to become minister for health, um, which was. As you may recall, the Abbott government was having a lot of trouble getting its budget through and some of its proposals through. Um, and so then she got caught up in a in a minor sort of scandal about was she coming to the surface paradise and to look at a property and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, but she's been been a member of a very long time, um, and. Uh, we assume she's been. It was a bit, a bit disappointing that the Liberal Party didn't have much of a contest for any of these positions. Um, and uh, you've got the, you've got the women's issue lurking in the background. And so she is supposed to be the, you know, the representative of the women sort of vote, if you like. And she's she's made lots of speeches along those lines, which is a little bit unfortunate that that if that's what she thinks her role is. Um, so she has been a member for a long time. Um, she, I would not call her an outstanding performer in Parliament, but I wouldn't call her a bad performer in Parliament. And she seemed to be doing, in terms of handling things, in, in the in her recent portfolio. But she is from the appears to be from the soft side of the Liberal Party. Yeah, but how soft? How well, soft? how soft? That that's the Liberal I'm Party with a lot of soft people. I live in one of the teal seats, so I know when I I know soft when I see it. Um, mm. And uh, I, I, they're, they're, well, they're, they're not a very nice sponge, even though they talk about having a kind of gentle politics. Well, the trouble with the, with the soft side of the Liberal Party, they they melt down very easily. Okay. Yeah, so they go to water very easily. That's that's the, that's the problem. Okay, um, and the the electric, you know, a lot of arguments, a lot of arguments are are, are in emotional terms, aren't they? In the political arena, right? Yep. You know the 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 way we we phrase and set a lot of arguments more so than in the past in my time. So emotional arguments. Um, uh, 
the way the you you watch the way the news is presented or watch the way interviews are conducted and so on. Now you may have heard about the Sri Lankan family who's been allowed to go back to Bilawea. Okay, you've, you've heard of that story. Okay. Some, yes, yeah, somewhat, somewhat. Okay. Now, no, no one, you, you don't hear, except unless you watch Sky News or something, you don't hear that they lost every court every court decision, right? Yep. They lost every court decision. Every, every court decision in Australia, they didn't have a case, right? That's, that's the point. Um, so, but... On Channel 9, when it's being discussed, all you hear about is the family and the people in Villarreal and all that sort of stuff, and it all feels wonderful and so on and so forth. And that's that's good. I'm glad we are a passionate society uh, and so on. I'm just pointing out that all the arguments uh, are often so much on emotional things rather than on rational discussion points. That's, that's the thing, and we're seeing that on, on so many levels, you know, so much assistance or, or something on that ground, okay? So because that makes it hard if you're from the right or conservative where you are more willing to accept things as they are, right? Conservatives tend to want to largely accept things as they are where they tend not to be too big or accepting that government's going to fix things because every solution brings another problem, okay? Right. Um, uh, look, the Centre for Independent Studies um, recently had a sort of uh, uh, meeting where we discussed what what would be the list of things we would like government to do, and everyone sent in their list. My my thing I sent in was I want government to do less. Right. <laughs> that's, that's that's mine. Um, that's my list of of things I want. Now I don't, I don't want them to do any more. I want them to do less. That's my problem. But not everyone had that view. Well, we, we look to government now more than ever before. It's quite extraordinary. Hmm. Bit of a hot point. There are some in the party who do believe that maybe they should go off and form their own party. And we do, we've do. we seen one sort of attempt at it with uh, the new Liberals. And, I mean, Simon Holmes Accord has been backing the Climate 200. Is it time for these people who... <laughs> are dissatisfied with the current Liberal Party structure? Is it maybe time for them to leave? Or do, how do we, do, how do, we co do we coexist or is it time we start talking? Well, look, you can see what happened in South Australia when Steel Hall, the Premier, left and set up the Liberal movement, right? We all remember the Liberal movement? Uh, Does well, anyone... I, I do not. I, I will profess my ignorance, uh, Scott. But okay, so the Liberal movement was this sort of, it was kind of brought in the you know, redistribution system. So it basically turned its back on the Playford era, the old style thing. And the, and the, Liberal, part, and the Liberal movement disappeared. It's disappeared, yep. okay? It's gone. <laughs> no one, no one, I've got a book about the Liberal movement, which I won in the prize at university in 1979 or something. Um, so, 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 and in, in the New South Wales Liberal Party, you seem to have two parties going on there. Yep. You've got, you know, the, the factions, and, and you've got one of your faction leaders who actually donates to the Labor Party, which I find quite extraordinary. Um, no. And um, um, so, you almost have two parties going on in, in New South Wales, don't you? You almost have two parties happening in New South Wales. Uh, um, and I, I think I think uh, uh, it, 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 the, the party, you know, looks looks very odd. It doesn't work out which way which way is it which way is it going? Okay. Yeah. And the LN, the LNP in Queensland is and not talking about the federal scene. The LNP at the state scene is is not is not much better, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, I read every press release they put out, uh, and they've done. Pretty minimal harm to the Palaszczuk sort of government, but there we are. That, that's another issue. I mean, but in in Queensland, I hope I have this correct. You used to have, I mean, the late great Joe Bielke Peterson running your state for twenty years, and that was the Queensland Nationals. They were separate from the Liberals, but then after he left, there was this whole movement to merge the two together. 
and a lot of the social conservatives almost kind of blended into the background or went into hiding? Have I got this? Uh, it's more complicated than that. Look, in a way, they had to come together because uh, every election was, um, you know, who's going to lead the government, you know, after the election, is it going to be a Liberal leader or a National Party leader? That sort of happened. Um, and so it was very, it was fraught with that sort of problem. Um, um, and and um, the the Alan, and Lawrence Springborg is now back as president. He'd been, he, he, he would have been a great premier, Lawrence, and he was quite a good minister. But um, so, uh, so the Liberal Party, the LNP in Queensland, uh, hasn't quite worked out where it, there is the sort of city, the city clique, if you like, and the Queensland is a very different state from the, the rest of rest of like rest of Australia, uh, demographically. Hmm. I mean, um, Queensland, I think, similar to last election in twenty nineteen, almost was like the microcosm for why the Liberal Party either won or lost. Is that is that a fair assumption? Because in twenty nine. Um, I mean, yeah, it seems that last last election, 2019, you had a, a huge blue wave up there, but now 2022, the green wave or sort of a rebellion, whatever you want to call it. And it's, that was indicative of the country or became a sort of, it's like Queensland is like a, in, in our, is our Ohio. Is that, is that somewhat a thing? Oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, Queensland at this recent election, the ALP did not win one seat from the Liberal Party or the National Party. Okay, not one seat. Uh, the, the the ALP I think only holds five seats in Queensland. Um, the they they lost a seat to the Greens. The Liberals lost seats to uh, the Greens, um, but they didn't lose any seats to the ALP. Um, so this is quite an extraordinary, so, you know, this election, um, this is not a great, this has not been a great victory for the ALP. People should not be wringing their hands that this is the end of the Liberal Party as we know it. Um, this is not a great election for the Labor Party. The Labor Party's got a mandate to do nothing, basically, because they didn't put up anything. Um, uh, you know, they've got a, a, a sort of so-called Minister for a Republic. Well, that wasn't even discussed in the election campaign, okay? Um, um, and and all, the, all that. So the, the Labor Party, um, uh, and what, what the Liberal Party should be countering now is all this bit about blaming the previous government, you know, blaming Morrison for everything. And when a liberal like Birmingham or someone attacks Morrison, they're playing in the Labor Party's hands of, of blaming the previous government for everything. When the previous government and certainly had its faults, uh, that as I wrote in the New York Times or it was, um, um, I, I much rather the COVID results in Australia than the COVID results in the United States any day. Um, because because we've at least got a national health system, which America hasn't got. Um, so, you know, there, there are certainly major flaws as the Morrison government, but uh, the, the ALP are very thin on the ground on what they can claim uh, the, the win. You know, this is not... This is, Albanese is not Whitlam, okay? He is not Hawke, and he is definitely not Paul Keating. He, matter of fact, he would never have even supported them had he been a member of Parliament game. But he would never have even supported Whitlam. Whitlam would have been too far to the right for him. Okay, um, so I, I think the Liberal Party's got to pull together and 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 counteract the propaganda that's coming out. And it's a bit like what happened to the Bajolki Peterson government. Yeah. The Bajolki Peterson government. The, the Fitzgerald report did not find systemic corruption through Queensland government. That I've, you can read the report, show it to me where it is. The police were corrupt 
every police force has got corruption. New South Wales has had umpteen oh, yeah. royal commissions oh, into yeah. police. Absolutely. Victoria just had a royal commission into police informants, for goodness sake, um, and so forth. Um, but we, are, the non labour side of politics, allowed the Bajolka Peterson government to be portrayed as totally corrupt. Okay? So when, when Newman was Premier, on the anniversary of the Fitzgerald report, he came out and, and condemned the 30 years of coalition government. Um, and yet many, many good things happened to that government. And it wasn't, it wasn't corrupt to the core. That is, that is just a non, that's a Griffith University <laughs> story because Griffith University people got jobs in the Labor government. So can we stop, can we, the non-Labor side of politics is really lousy at defending itself. Um, the Labor Party defends losers. You know, Ben Chifley lost. Everett never won an election. Caldwell never won an election. Yep. Whitlam won too. They're heroes. They're all heroes. But our heroes, we knock. Okay? Right? We knock all the time. And we're knocking Morrison straight away. Everything he did... Um, if it wasn't for Morrison, to my mind, we would never have won the 2019 election. We would never have won with Turnbull, okay? Mm -hmm. And Turnbull was not a great success story, okay? I wanted to say it. It's true. That's a very, I think it's a universal. Next question's from um, um, Andy. Yeah, so I, I've got a question here from the audience. Um, so, but politics is also the art of the possible. We had a lot of aggressive policy making under the Howard government, and isn't it fair to say that the Australian public were over it? What was aggressive about it? Um, I, I'm assuming perhaps they're referring to work choices. Well, um, the work choice, the, 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 the Howard government got elected uh, on a mandate. It was very clear about industrial relations reform in the first period, um, and that was a very clear election thing. Uh, and when he won the 2004 election, uh, just remember the first lot of industrial relations reform uh, in 1996 to 98 uh, was severely attacked uh, and uh, modified by the Senate and by the Labor Party. Uh, they got they did a compromise, got certain things through, and they won the 2004 election and they got control of the Senate. Mm. Uh, and the issue was, should they proceed with the next step? And you read the industrial relations people, they argued that there, there were more things that needed to be done. So I don't, I don't, I think the way it was done, you know, 1,500 pages of, leg, of, of legislation and, and having Kevin Andrews pops as maybe not the best person to run it, I don't call it aggressive if it's been part of your party's philosophy and, and John Howard was the uh, spokesman on industrial relations for a long time as well as leader. Um, I don't call it aggressive in getting it through the Senate uh, and using your numbers in a democratically elected process. I hardly call it aggressive. I think, I, I think the aggression, you can criticise the policy um, and a lot, of, a lot of the work choices which remained intact too, by the way, obviously with the Rudd government. So um, what do you mean? What do you mean by aggressive? Okay, uh, yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I don't sort of, I don't sort of buy, it. I don't buy that um, argument. Maybe on the on the waterfront, you might argue that the policies were aggressive in taking on uh, the unions, if you like. Uh, but look who they're dealing with. The unions have been investigated by royal commissions and found to be corrupt and so on. Um, so uh, th there's got to be a certain level of Aggression in policy. I mean, look, look at look at Keating. I mean, his policy. You're calling Keating a, a soft, mild person in uh, calling the opposition prostitutes or arguing for uh, financial deregulation and the floating of the exchange rate and for cutbacks and things. Um, uh, Bob Hawke was exactly a shrinking violet. So I don't, I don't, I don't agree quite with the thing. I, I believe Howard had a mandate. Uh, to go ahead with work choices, uh, though it wasn't expressly stated in that in the 2004 election, that um, it, it shouldn't be not a surprise. Okay. Yeah, I mean we do have a a follow up um, 
that the they were aggressive policies in the sense that Australia was highly uh, that, that in Australia these policies were highly controversial and contested and that there was continued political fighting so in terms of pushing the envelope well yeah, that's a really good question to be honest well, you might call them innovative policies rather than aggressive policies yeah. um, actually that's... I, I mean Australia has um, gone gone through you know we've we've lowered tariffs that was um, we've broken out of the agreements that we had on a whole stack of policies and Australia has benefited uh, you know from financial deregulation and all those things we wouldn't have got through uh, the GFC we wouldn't have got through the Asian financial crisis 998 if those changes had not been made and they were pushed through by you know both sides of politics were involved in this process um, the problem has been the problem has been really since 2010 in large covering coalition governments we've not had a real agenda of reform uh, in the proper sense of the word um, we've we've used that word a lot but we really the productivity commission keeps saying we haven't been we don't have an agenda of reform our industrial productivity is very low um, um, and so on and that we've not addressed a whole stack of other reforms that need to be done we've stopped reforming in a sense and we're, we're starting to bear the consequences of that of inflation uh, and high prices of things and poor skills in, 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 in doing things okay so we haven't we haven't progressed that reform reform has got to be ongoing to, to be, be agree, to get things through and sometimes governments have to be aggressive to get things done Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so how, how would we best reform the Liberal Party? So br bring it back to a party of Howard and Menzies. Well, I, I think firstly, it's got to have some members. <laughs> it's got a very low um, oh, yeah. membership. I mean, there's a, there's a branch up in the Blue Mountains, which has been going since 1949, that got closed down a year or so ago, indicative of the state of the Liberal Party. Um, uh, I mentioned to you earlier about public funding of political parties, which I'm I'm very much against public funding of political parties, right? Um, the reason I'm against it is because I think it makes political parties lazy, right? They don't have to go out and get members uh, and so on. I know, I know the logic behind it and so on, and, and I don't agree with that, that logic, but I think it's made political parties, you know, Menzies said the party had to be a broad, membership-based party capable of raising a fair amount of money for itself uh, and not dependent on... Menzies did not like business people particularly, by the way. Uh, uh, he, he didn't have much time for them. Um, and I think the first thing you gotta do, you gotta get the, the party, it's gotta become an attractive thing for people to join. Uh, and they got, that means they gotta have some meaningful say in how it's been run and who are selected to represent them. And that's really important, that we don't have decisions that's made by a small clique uh, or faction. So that, that's, that's one thing. Um, secondly, you've got to have a really good um, selection process of who you're putting in uh, to, to run for seats and, and things. Uh, are these, do these people actually have any commitment to what the Liberal party is supposed to be about which is essentially a party of smallish government not uncaring government a party that promotes individual enterprise and effort and difference and so on um, and um, a party that believes government is trust trust more in individuals than a trust in in government so there's a whole range of things the the messages the liberal party give out are, are very confusing about what it's what it stands for because it's it's constantly playing pragmatic politics all the time but isn't is that is that the problem is could that be the problem with having such a broad church is that you know at least with a party with a singular goal or, or, or like a, a sort of narrow scope it can be argued that at least you have an identity and at least there's sort of a, a kind of clearly defined party. Oh. you're not trying to appease everybody 
well, with, with, with that, how has that navigated in the past? Yeah. Well, well, if you've watched the election campaign, if you watch, remember the 2019 election campaign, and Morrison made a really good speech about the quiet Australians, right? That, that sort of speech, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, in office, he didn't put it into practice. And then in the recent election campaign, in the last week of the campaign, he talked about housing, right? Um, and the superannuation thing, uh, and unfortunately, but he, if you if you read Menzies' speech on housing, and I've read a lot about this, um, and, and and Morrison hinted at it a little bit here and there about the the family, it's the importance of the family, and the importance of the house and the home, and so on and so forth. But he didn't articulate that into a a real philosophy and goal. Okay. And that's that's what you've got to do. I mean, you know that movie about Churchill. You know, he sent he sent narration into war, sort of thing. You know, his speeches and so on. You've got to be able to articulate to people. I sort of believe the Liberal Party, when it gets in the office and has to cut back, it looks like a mob of accountants, basically. Oh yeah, looks like they're from, look, look, looks they're they're from KPMG or something. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and and it does it, it it to young people. It doesn't appear to be very idealistic uh, about about things, or it's not articulating that. So, it requires what the Liberal Party's got to develop is a narrative and a story uh, that it's um, uh, it's all you know it's all right to be a liberal, and this is what we are on about. And as, we're not just going to talk the talk; we're actually going to yeah. present that in the way we present our policies. Um, and liberals, you know. And I do. I've done a lot of things in housing, and I can't get over some of the regulations on housing, which are brought in by liberal governments, which only make housing more expensive, uh, by the way. Um, so it's it's having a narrative, having a positive philosophy, mm. and also putting in the framework where people feel it's 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 a good thing to vote for, uh, and and also, you know, you know, in politics, in political science, we talk about speaking truth to power, you know, this idea that a minister or staffer like me has got to tell the minister the truth, okay, which I hope I did. At the same time, politicians have got to speak truth to the people and tell us the real problems that we've got. And we've got too much, too much talk fest and not enough telling us this is the real economic situation this in. This is the real problems we've got. And this is why we can't do X, Y, and Z. But too much of the politicians go along with that emotional side of things and pretend everything's fine and talk in that language. So no. basically, that, 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 that's why Maggie Thatcher was there. That's why sometimes, sometimes, you know, uh, Pauline, you know, sometimes gets some things right, um, not always. Um, so it's it's that it's that an inability to tell people what's what's really happening during the COVID crisis. The prime minister did not make one prime ministerial address to the nation. Well, right? I did not notice that really. Not one. So we had the prime minister with the national cabinet, which I thought and I've written is a bad idea, uh, where he just appeared to be a spokesman for. The 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 um, the premiers, okay, um, and and it, it seemed the whole thing. No one sort of told us the truth about what was going on about the COVID. You know, I'm all in favour of vaccination, all in favour of those things, but the Morrison government got blamed for things which had been agreed to by the national cabinet, which had agreed to by the chief health officers mm -hmm. at their meetings. Um, and we didn't really have a clear articulation of what's going on and explain to us, this is what government is doing. This is, this is the limitations we've got and so on. Um, so I think that's one of the problems that, uh, I mean, Dutton might be able to do that more effectively and cut through. He's a, he's a more plain talker, I hope. We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's hope so. Um, we do have to close now. Um, Scott Fraser, mm. thank you for taking um, so much out of your time um, to come speak with us this afternoon. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, no thank worries. You.
the pleasure was mine. Really insightful. So, so this has been a Macquarie University Liberal, uh, Liberal Club Sunday Sessions uh, podcast episode. Um, we will see you next week. Um, I, my name is Andrew Kremen, and I've been joined by Nicholas Walker. See yep. you then. Bye. Goodbye. God bless. <laughs>